good afternoon. Uh, this is going to be another exciting uh, uh, series of talks on the topic of higher visual perception and basically how do visual statistics observe uh, object recording in the brain. We're going to start uh, promptly with the first speaker, Anita Parsupati from the University of Washington. Who's going to talk about encoding things and stuff, multiplex form and texture signals in primate before. I'd like to start off by uh, thanking the organizers for inviting me to this very uh, stimulating conference. So um, let's start off by looking at a scene like this one. So when you look at a complex scene such as this one, we see a few objects, um, like these boats, these cliffs, but most of the rest of the image is texture. The sky, the waves, the banks, and even the surface of these waves. Fred Adelson, more than 20 years ago, labeled these things and stuff. So it's not my clever naming, it's somebody else's, it's borrowed. Um, and he um, lamented the fact that scientists were really preoccupied with object recognition when most of what we see is stuff. And processing all of this stuff is critically important for scene perception. And it's really important for many of the decisions we make. For example, if you want to decide whether this is a good day to sail, or if, it's, uh, if these cliffs are good to scale, or if you want to pick a good picking spot on the banks, for all of these things, you need to process um, information about stuff. In the primate brain, uh, things and stuff are processed along the ventral visual pathway. In the first page of this pathway, in the area of D1, uh, neurons encode visual scenes in terms of local orientation and spatial frequency. So basically, D1 neurons represent the stuff in the visual image. Uh, later on, in the higher stages along this pathway, in the area of D4, and in the, uh, the subregions of the inferior temporal cortex, neurons uh, begin to encode things in terms of um, selectivity for contours, object parts, and entire objects. Neurons in these higher stages also encode information about um, stuff. There are neurons that are selected for texture and color. But because most studies either focus on things or stuff, we don't really know how single neurons multiplex these information in these higher stages. And we also do not know how these representations for things arise from the earlier representations of so I'll hope to address both of these questions in my talk today. Okay. My thesis uh, for today's talk is that in V4, neurons encode both things and stuff, and many neurons do this jointly. And uh, this is advantageous from the standpoint of segmenting uh, scenes, and segmenting natural scenes. Okay. Um, I want to uh, tell you about three experiments today, so I'll probably go a little bit fast, but please Please feel free to stop me and ask me questions as I go along. In the first part of the talk, I want to tell you about how interior film modulates responses of neurons in area B4. Uh, in the second part of the talk, I want to tell you about comparing tuning for shape and texture in B4 neurons. And in the third part of the talk, I want to tell you about um, probing single units to see if they might provide insights into models for how B4 shapes select. Okay, so the starting point for all this is a demonstration that Ed Connor and I made more than 15 years ago looking at responses of B4 neurons to shapes. And we found that these responses could be explained on the basis of uh, two B4 from B curvature. So many neurons in area B4, we found, were sensitive to convexities and concavities in an object centered reference frame. What I mean by this can be illustrated by this example here. So if you have a neuron, that's tuned for a sharp convexity to the upper right, let's say, and this is the receptive field of the neuron, then such a neuron would respond, oops, sorry. Oops, I can't really go back. Okay. Um, such a neuron would respond strongly to this stimulus because that has a sharp convexity pointing to the upper right. It won't respond so well to this stimulus, which doesn't have that feature pointing in that direction. 
Um, this neuron won't respond so well to this stimulus either because even though it has a sharp convexity, it's not pointing to the upper brain. Okay? And we described uh, such preferences using a, uh, a descriptive model in terms of angular position and curvature. So curvature of the boundary, that's the convexity there, and um, object-centered position. So relative to the center of the object, this is 45 degrees in a counterclockwise direction. Okay? So all of these stimuli are preferred shapes for this neuron because they all have a sharp convexity pointing to the upper right, regardless of what the features are at all other locations along the boundary. And these are all non-preferred stimuli because the, the neuron won't respond well to that. Okay. So um, a second important characteristic that we um, have demonstrated is the translation invariance of these neurons. And that is, when you take the stimulus and move it within the receptive field of the cell, the magnitude of the responses might go down, but the shape tuning preferences remain the same. So all of these will remain preferred shape, and all of these will remain non-preferred shape, even though the magnitude of the response is down. Okay? Now, uh, in thinking about how you might build such selectivity for boundary curvature, uh, you might build it just based on the way in which you draw it. Okay, that might be an intuitive way for you to think about it. Okay, so if you have a sharp convexity pointing up here, maybe you pull oriented signals from this particular orientation and this particular orientation from preceding stages. Um, and if you want selectively for a uh, shallower curve, then maybe you pull uh, orient multiple different orientations that fall along that progression. And that sort of is essentially how one prominent model builds up uh, tuning for boundary curvature. And this is the HMAX model proposed by Poggio and colleagues. This was not to, uh, proposed to explain boundary curvature. This is a hierarchical model of visual cortex that they proposed. And uh, it was designed to achieve invariant recognition at the descendant of the neocognitive bond. And basically, it has alternating stages of selectivity and uh, maximally to build up in there. Okay? So if you take the first three stages of this, uh, it's thought to be analogous to V1, V2, V4, etc. And uh, in 2007, Kadu and colleagues demonstrated that you could fit this part of the model to explain um, the kinds of responses that we see in every so let's take a look at just this portion of the model because that becomes relevant to uh, predictions for the experiments I'll talk about next. So uh, basically, the first level of this, um, this model is what they call the S1 state, and that is analogous to V1 simple cells. It has uh, oriented filters that, have, that are of uh, uh, different phase and different position and different orientation. And then um, the next step, they max pool over position and phase. And so you end up with a phase invariant, a contrast invariant oriented signal. You can do that in all different orientations. That's um, analogous to an idealized complex cell. Then you can pool signals from uh, multiple orientations here to build up, let's say, preferences for a sharp convexity point up. And if you max pool across uh, position at this stage, then you can build up um, position invariant selectivity for that particular conjunction of features. Okay? Um, so this is the model that they propose, and uh, one prediction that this model makes is inherent in this um, phase cooling, max cooling of phase state. Essentially, you lose information about phase over here, um, so it's a phase invariant signal over here, and so what this model predicts is that you should have uh, similar responses to stimuli that are outline and that are fill shapes. Okay, so fill stimuli and outline stimuli should evoke the same sort of responses from this uh, neuron. And this is an instantiation of the model. These are responses to fill stimuli. These are responses to outline stimuli, and there's a strong correlation. Okay, and what I say, well, that makes sense because you know people are really good at recognizing outline stimuli, and there are psychological studies that have shown that uh, people are just as good at recognizing these as they are these, which are full color photographs. They're just as accurate and just as fast. Even little kids can do this. Um, and, uh, you know, artists, um, 
you know, since the time of happening, things have exploited this company. Okay? But on the flip side of that is that just because we're as good as these two things doesn't mean that's how it should be represented, that we do should have similar representation. And we are good at recognizing uh, outline only when these are isolated stimuli. When you put them against a textured background or in a cluttered scene, it becomes very difficult. And I can illustrate that with these two uh, images here. So basically, this is a, I took a an image um, of uh, something. I don't know if any of you can recognize what this is, but I passed it through a canny edge detector, and I just showed I'm just showing you the edge information. And it's very hard to figure out what this is. And similarly, this is a Mooney image, and I'm just drawing the um, contrast boundaries over here. If I give you the full image, it's very easy to see what it is. But with edge information alone, it becomes very hard to send them the image. Okay. Um, so, so we wanted to ask, what do neurons and visual cortex do? All right. So uh, we did this experiment. We basically said, let's look at the responses to stimuli that are filled in and stimuli that are outlined. We used all of these shapes, presented it different orientations, and presented the filled versions and the outlined. Uh, this is all work done by Regina Papakina, who, when she was a grad student in my lab, along with Wadbear. Okay, so um, we recorded from uh, more than 100 neurons doing all of these uh, with these stimuli, and we asked what the responses were like. Okay, so one example of neuron is in this slide here. So this is a neuron that behaves uh, similar to what you would expect based on the HMAX model. So, these are responses to filled shapes. There's a broad range of responses. So this neuron was quite selective uh, for boundary curvature, and I'm not, I'm not showing you that here. I'm just showing you the responses. And when you look at the responses to outline stimuli, a bit weaker than responses to filled stimuli, but there is a good strong correlation. Okay, so that's consistent with the predictions of the H map model. Just there is a bit of a gain issue here, but other than that, it's very consistent. <coughs> But this was only about 20% of the neurons did this, okay? Other neurons showed a wide variety of response patterns. Too. So here is an example neuron that shows a broad range of responses to build stimuli, but responses are very weak, and this, the correlation is completely lost. Okay. Here's another example of a neuron that responds only to outline stimuli and not at all to and the last group of neurons responded to any stimulus we threw up on the screen, um, and there was no correlation at all. Okay? So this, this is the range of responses we saw, and um, you know the, the, the vast majority responded better to fill stimuli than outline stimuli, but uh, you know, only 20% explained by that change factor. So we have to think about modifications to that model in order for us to explain these responses. So we considered two modifications. Um, the first one is, we said, okay, let's throw away this face pooling, right? Instead of face pooling, let's um, just pull across position, and let's allow that face information to uh, float on through to V4. Uh, and that's consistent with uh, kind of responses we've seen in area V4 before. Many neurons are sensitive to the luminance contrast of the stimulus. There is luminance contrast information in the vast majority of neurons that we report from. Okay, so that's consistent with that idea. We call this the edge polarity model. And a second variant we considered was, well, we continue to phase pool, but then we added some unoriented filters. Okay, so this allowed us to not only uh, pool from, uh, to build selectivity based on oriented elements, but also an unoriented so when you build up selectivity for a shape with a sharp convective pointing to the top, then you can pull from the appropriate orientation, but also uh, an unoriented filter. Okay. And, and then we asked, we call this the unoriented fill model, and we asked, how does this model do compared to the original HVAC? And these are, um, and I can go through a lot more detail for anyone who's interested, but basically this is the upshot, and I'm showing that with one example cell here. So 
when you, this is a neuron that responded well to filled shapes, but not much at all to outline stimuli. Even when you train with both filled and outline stimuli, you're not able to shape that correlation in the original HMAX model. You still have a strong correlation between fill and outline responses. And that drops down when with this edge polarity model. So basically, you're able to uh, reduce the range of responses to outline uh, stimuli and also um, you know, flatten out that correlation. So you are, uh, now the neuron is selective for fill stimuli. So in the experiments that I've talked about now, and in all the experiments that we've done in the lab, we usually um, draw these shapes with a constant luminance contrast on the in the film. Okay. But what happens when you have texture, right? And so recently there have been a few experiments. Um, uh, ones from ones in V2 from Tony Martin and Aerosimentalis lab, and also another one. Um, from Palazzo's lab in uh, area B4, showing that texture modulates responses of B4 neurons. So uh, this is a slide from Okasaba et al. who um, studied texture selectivity in area B4. And they show that you can explain uh, texture selectivity in area B4 on the basis of higher order human state. So you're not just looking at uh, spatial frequency and orientation content, in the image, but you're now looking at correlations across positions, so linear cross position or energy cross position. So in these experiments, they look only at texture selectivity. In our experiments, we were looking only at shape selectivity. So we wanted to ask, are these the same neurons that are selective to textures and shapes? Um, can they be explained by, uh, by one model that explains both kinds of selectivity? Are these different groups of neurons? And so to address these questions, we basically um, did an experiment where we uh, compared the responses to shape and texture stimuli in vitro. Okay, so uh, we used our standard set of shapes at all different orientations. And then when it came to texture, um, you know, rather than just pick an arbitrary set of texture stimuli, we looked at um, the perceptual, the human perception, te the human texture perception literature. And um, from that, uh, it seemed like there were three dimensions that were important for human texture perception. Coarseness, directionality, and regularity. Okay. So based on um, image statistics, we uh, created metrics um, for each of these uh, dimensions. And then we ran a whole bunch of textures. We measured these metrics uh, for a whole bunch of textures. And then we picked a subset that spanned these uh, dimensions, had a range of values along each of these dimensions. Okay? And this is the subset that we came up with. Sure, still arbitrary, but some principled arbitrariness, I would argue. Um, these textures over here are coarse, directional, and regular up here. Okay? And the ones down here are fine, non-directional, and we presented these textures at all different orientations and also at two different aperture sizes um, to make sure that what we're measuring is not just uh, simulations of specific parts of the receptor field. Uh, this is all work done by Tech Jim Kim, who's a postdoc in my lab. Okay, so let's look at some responses of some uh, single neurons uh, for texture, for shape and texture stimulus. So this is a response frequency histogram. Um, on the x-axis, it's normalized response, normalized just by the maximum, and the maximum is shown here. So the one here just means 32 spikes per second. So across the different shapes, the responses range from 0 to 32 spikes per second for this neuron. And this just tells you what fraction of stimuli, or what number of stimuli, have the response that is shown on the x-axis. Okay, the, the red line is the baseline for the particular neuron and the, the, the magenta uh, uh, star you can ignore for the purposes of this talk. Okay, so this is a neuron that shows a, you know, a response weakly to a lot of stimuli, but shows good, strong responses for some stimuli. And this is very standard for, you know, a nicely shaped selection. Now, if you look at the distribution for texture, this is what it looks like. It just doesn't care about any of the textures that we show. Okay? 
This is one example neuron. Here's the second example neuron that responds uh, nicely and selectively for, for textures, but responses to shape are somewhat weaker, not as selective for shape. And here's a, uh, here's a third example that's equally uh, diverse in its response for shapes and textures. Okay? And we recorded from 109 neurons uh, with these sets of stimuli, and we can now uh, we're, we can we can quantify these distributions of two metrics. One is the peak for the best response to the shape versus the texture, and that's what's shown here. So best shape responses versus best texture responses. They tend to be positively correlated. So it seems like there's something like a dynamic range knob where if the response to the best stimulus in texture is high, best best response to the shape is also high. But uh, overall, across the population, it seems like shapes tend to evoke stronger responses than textures. Um, and then the second metric we used is a standard deviation of the normalized response distribution. So this is unaffected by what the maximum is, which is captured here. We just take the standard deviation of this. And that's why here. And there is a nice negative correlation between the standard deviation for shape and the standard deviation for texture responses. So down here are neurons that are strongly, show us nice strong uh, range of responses to shape stimuli, but not to texture stimuli. And here are neurons that show a nice broad range of responses to texture stimuli, but not shape stimuli. There are a bunch of neurons that are selected for both, but there seems to be a nice continuum from neurons that are selected for textures to neurons that are selected for shape. Okay, so um, the, the neurons down here generally tend to be curvature tuned, and I'm not going to show you examples of that, but if you're interested, I'm happy to show you uh, later. But we asked about these new neurons that show a diverse uh, set of responses for textures. We want you to know what these neurons are tuned for, okay? And um, I'll show you a couple of examples. So here's an example of a neuron that showed nice broad uh, diversity in responses to texture. These are textures that it responded strongly to, and these are textures that it responded weakly to, okay? It's hard to uh, find anything consistent over here by just looking at the preferred textures, but if you look at the non-preferred textures, they all have directional energy. It's in all different directions, but they all seem to have directional energy. And if we um, take the uh, directionality metric that we measured for each of these textures, and we plot the responses against this directionality metric, there is a negative correlation. So the more directional the texture is, the weaker the response is. So this is a correlation with a perceptual dimension uh, identified by identified based on human texture perception literature. Here's a second example. So these are all preferred textures for this particular neuron, and these are all non-preferred textures. And the, the metric that this correlates well with is coarseness. So these are all coarse textures, whereas these are much more fine textures. And when you correlate coarseness, uh, coarseness index um, to the uh, neuronal responses, you see a positive. All right. So um, in the in the in the plot that I showed you with the negative um, correlation, um, there were a lot of neurons that were selective both for shape and texture. We wanted to ask whether tuning for shape and textures is um, separable in these neurons, or are they dependent? Okay. So um, for this. We basically, after our initial experiment where we just presented shape and textures and asked uh, with how the selectivity compared, we chose a subset of the shapes, so three shapes and ten different textures. The textures were always the same across all the runs. So we chose three different shapes, one that responded strongly, one that responded weakly, and one intermediate. I think um, we always chose this circle. Um, and then we painted the textures on the surface of the ship and ask, how do the responses change? Um, is there, you know, basically, are the 
is a tuning along these two dimensions. Can you explain it on the basis of a multiplicative model? So tuning for shape uh, and tuning for texture. Okay. So I'm going to show you three examples. The first one I think is uh, this neuron labeled A over here, which was selected for both shape and texture. And you can see, um, hopefully, that the, the color line colors here are representing three shapes. And uh, hopefully you can see that the texture selected we seem very consistent across the three different uh, across the three different shapes. And also shape selectivity, you know, the blue line is always higher than the red, always higher than the okay. And uh, so okay, this is a second example. This one is uh, the neuron with D over here. Uh, this is my grad student did this just to make it difficult for me. Um, so this is a neuron that uh, was not was not very shape selective, but was quite texture selective. And you can see that the responses were, uh, you know, very similar for the three shapes, and they continue to be very similar regardless of what texture you painted on it. But um, the texture itself modulates the response. And then here's a third example that is selected for both texture and shape. And there was a strong modulation by both. So this uh, example neuron is the one down here in C. And it didn't show any texture modulation because uh, the textures were all presented with a circular aperture in our main experiment. But when you paint the textures on top of the preferred shape, that's the green shape over here, then you see a beautiful, uh, beautiful selection. Sure. Okay, so you can, for all three neurons, you can um, model this on the basis of the multiplicative model, and that explains these two Okay, so the upshot is that we think there is a nice continuum from neurons that are just texture selective to neurons that are just shape selective, and um, it, it looks like it's a, um, it's, um, a multiplicative model can explain uh, the tuning along these two. two In the last um, part of my talk, I want to tell you a little bit about um, a new uh, new direction we're headed in um, to, um, <coughs> you know, in our search for models for explaining V4 shape selectively, uh, we've uh, started to we've started to grow deep convolutional nets to see if we can gain some insights into how V4 shape selectively. Uh, for this, uh, we're using AlexNet, uh, which is um, the network that uh, won the ImageNet contest in 2012. <laughs> but it doesn't matter which network you use, we've tried others too, and the results are very, very similar. Uh, this network has five convolutional layers and three fully connected layers. And in the first layer, the first convolutional net, uh, layer, the properties look, oh, okay. Sorry, I should have. I should tell you that when I say we are doing this, it's the work of uh, Dean Hospital, who's a grad student with White there. Okay. Um, so in the first convolutional layer, we see filters that look like this, that are very reminiscent of uh, V1, you know, the response properties of V1 neuron. So we wanted to ask, what about neurons deeper in the network? Do they have properties that one might think of as being curvature tuned? or uh, basically curvature to and translation impairment. And um, you know, there are several laboratories that have looked at deep convolutional events and thought about responsible neurons, um, for example, Jim DiCarlo and Dan Gammons um, and Nick uh, Previs Gorte. Um, they've been looking at it from a different, um, they've used a different strategy. Basically, they take subpopulations of these neurons, of these units, and um, fit it to uh, single or multi-unit activity or fMRI voxel signals and ask about the similarity between these representations. Our strategy is different. Um, what we want to do is something we call artificiology. Uh, basically, we're trying to analyze the artificial, uh, artificial network. So if somebody you know, snuck into my lab and replaced one of my monkey's brains with AlexNet, stuck AlexNet in it, and then put the animal in the booth for me, and I was recording from one of these single units, would I say, oh, this looks nothing like the brain I know? 
Or would I say, oh, there is beautiful curvature to neurons today, right? So that's the basic idea behind this. And so we're basically doing the same experiment we do uh, in the monkeys with this network. We use the same visual stimuli, and we use the same analysis methods. So we're taking the responses, and we're fitting the angular position curvature model, um, which I'm happy to explain in detail for anyone who's interested. And then uh, we're also assessing translation invariance. So there are two properties we're looking at, curvature tuning and translation invariance. And we want to ask, do these neurons look like, do these units look like curvature tuned before? And if they do, then we want to go in and try to analyze the network to try and gain some insights into how one might uh, come up with ideas for how one might be for before uh, curvature tuning. Okay, so, um, so we, we went through and analyzed a bunch of units, actually all units in the network. Um, you know, we, because it's convolutional, we just take the middle unit in all the layers, and I can walk you through the details of that. And this is a unit from convolutional layer 2. So uh, the color scale here uh, shows the responses. So these are all stimuli that evoke strong responses from that unit. Um, these are shapes that evoke weak responses from that unit. And this is a unit that responds strongly when there's a sharp like weak one to the left. And if you fit the um, angular position curvature model, you get a good correlation. Okay, this is just in convolutional layer two. Um, this is a unit in fully connected layer seven, one of the last layers, and it's a uh, light sharp convexity to the upper right. Again, good correlation. Okay, so you can, uh, if we draw a cumulative distribution, um, con one stands apart. That doesn't look anything like V4. V4 is this red curve here. Pretty much all the convolutional layers have um, more curvature to neurons than V4. Or they look like V4. Okay. Now, okay, this is just curvature to me. What about translation invariance? Because that is a key property of a V4 neuron. If you take a stimulus and move it around the receptor field, the responses may drop off. But the preferences, the shape preferences of the neuron remain very consistent. I'm going to sh first show you uh, data point, uh, data uh, before neuron data, and then I'll show you uh, data from out. Okay, so this is a before neuron that we've studied with 40 different shapes at four different positions. So this is the center position. This is moved off 13% uh, off to the right, 13% off to the left, 26% off to the left. Okay. And um, sorry about these axes labels are all you know different for the different plots, but basically what's happening is the responses are strong here and here, and then drop off to the sides. And uh, you can look at the correlation and the pairwise correlation in responses between the center and each one of these positions. Okay, and that's what's shown here. So there's a good amount of correlation. Now, what I'm plotting here is the response, average response magnitude in green for these different uh, stimuli. And as I told you, responses are weak in this, these two positions, but then they drop off to the right and drop off to the left. But correlation between the center and all these positions remains about 0.8 in all, for all of these positions. Okay? Even though the responses drop down, the correlation remains high. All right. Now uh, we did the same thing for every unit in AlexNet, and I'm going to give you the layer averages. And this is the the convolutional layer two. Okay. Again, this green line gives you the response magnitude, so that defines the size of the receptive field. And when you look at the correlation in response between uh, between the different between the center and all of these positions. That drops off much more rapidly than the response magnitude. So this unit, even though it's responding out here, it's responding to something else, right? It's not. It's not translation invariant. Okay. Now, when you look at convolutional convolutional layer four or FC seven, you see much better, much more consistency in uh, the response magnitude and the quality. Okay. So even though these are this is a convolutional model, it's only in con four and the higher layers 
that translation invariant starts to emerge. And you can see the, the extent of translation invariance compare the extent of translation invariance in the formula with that in the different layers of the CNN. Convolutional layer 2, 3, and 4 are worse than before. It's convolutional layer 5 that matches up to 4 plus 1. And the FCs, the fully connected layers, are way better. Okay? And all of this, we also did all of this analysis with um, an untrained network as well. And we find that both, I haven't shown you the data for curvature tuning, but both for curvature tuning and translation invariant, training is <coughs> So it's not just, what I'm describing is not just a property of the, of the network itself, just because it's convolutional, just because of the way it was built, you don't see curvature tuning or translation invariance. Um, all of that lies over here. But B4 is over here, and this is where all the, um, what I'm showing you here is factually correct. Um, the trained network has properties that match up um, with people who are on the common side. Okay. Um, you know, I think it was Conrad who said yesterday, you really look, need to look at the data. You know, these metrics are all fine, but we really wanted to see what it is that these units were responding to, and did it even make any sense? Is it just something that, you know, it just because you have like so many thousands of units, some units just happen to have properties that are well fit by this model, or is there is there something meaningful here? So we went back and um, for the um, 20 or so best um, units that match up in terms of, um, you know, curvature tuning and translation invariance, we pulled up those units and asked, what are the what are the stimuli? What are the images these units respond to? And what are the features in these uh, in these units, uh, in these images that these neurons respond to? Okay, so this is a unit in con two. These are the five best images for this unit. These are the five worst images for this unit. The the red squares, because these are convolutional units, they are just looking at a small part. These red squares represent the parts of the image that this particular unit is looking at. And um, we couldn't really figure out what it was, so we implemented a, a deconvolution algorithm proposed by Weiler and Perkis. So basically, you take the image, you take the responses to the image, and then project backwards, and, pre and project it all the way back onto the image, and identify, and that helps you identify the features that drove that particular unit. And here, I'm drawing the, the uh, these features are drawn scaled up three times. Okay, so this particular unit is responding to um, a shallow curve, you know, at, at this particular orientation, 135 degrees, shallow curve, 135 degrees. Maybe it's a texture because it need, appears to need multiple lines over here. And then the the weak responses or for things that are more orthogonal. Okay, so um, and and a lot of the units in COM two and COM three seem to res be responding to texture uh, textures made uh, made up of curves and um, congruent conjunctions that may be from different objects. So, for example, accidental contours. So um, here, this is this is a unit that responds well when you have a conjunction of this orientation and this orientation, and if you see that, you might be able to see that. It's hard to see this. If you're interested, you can come and look at it on my laptop and I can zoom in for you. But basically, that conjunction comes from a part of this espresso maker and this uh, label over here. So they are from two different parts of two different objects that just happen to um, come together in that fashion. This is what we see in CON2 and uh, CON3. But as you go into CON5, it starts to make more sense in terms of selectivity for parts of objects. So here is a, an example of a unit from CON5. It responds to best to these five images and worst to these five. And if you do the uh, deep evolution, they, this is it responds to the ears of this dog, these dog ears, or the steeples, right? Again, dog ears here, and this is the uh, 
tuck the feathers up on top of the little head. All of them have a convexity pointing up. Okay, and it's a part of these objects, and it doesn't respond well to features that are more circular. Okay. And if you, when you go deeper in, when you go to uh, FC6 or FC7, FC8, it's because these um, units are looking at the entire image, this deconvolution method doesn't work as well. And so instead of uh, trying to figure out what this deconvolution might be, um, might represent, we said, okay, let's um, just basically compare the best images to the best shapes from our stimulus set. So uh, these are the best five, five best images for this uh, FC6 unit, okay? Then we can go in and say, well, because we presented these stimuli too, we uh, rank ordered the stimuli in terms of responses, and the best stimuli all had a concavity up to the top with you know, uh, projections on each side, um, sort of reminiscent of, of, of uh, these hourglass images. Uh, this is a starfish, we call this the starfish cell um, unit, and uh, it responds to all of these things which have pointy things up to the top, and uh, similarly, they, it responds to these shapes that all have pointy things. And then there are, uh, there are other units that respond well to uh, balls and circular things, and when you look at the stimuli in our shape set that they respond to, they all have rather curvature on the top. So there seems to be, and, and this is the uh, bathing cap, swimming cap unit uh, that responds to the shapes that also have on the top. Okay. So there seems to be some consistency between the images uh, that, that these units respond to and the shapes in our stimuli. And so, um, I mean, this, you know, not that this tells us anything, but, but basically, you, we now have some candidate uh, units in, uh, in AlexNet that we can go in and look at their, uh, their rating patterns and say what kinds of properties, what kinds of weights might give rise to the kinds of selectivity um, that are consistent with curvature tuning and translation invariance. And that might give us some ideas for how to build uh, curvature to neurons in D4 from the inputs uh, in D5. Okay? Um, with that, this is just a summary of the three things I told you about. So, D4 neurons really care, like even curvature to D4 neurons, if you think of them as uh, encoding information about the boundary, really uh, care about the interior fill as well. Um, <laughs> V4 neurons, you know, for forever we, we studied V4 neurons with shapes that have just a black, chromatic, or a luminous contrast. Now our problem gets harder because these neurons seem to lie along the continuum from uh, neurons that are texture tuned to neurons that are shape tuned with lots of neurons in between that are tuned to both, uh, uh, both stimulus classes and, and luckily at least the tuning appears to be separable. Um, and and uh, we think at this point, um, some of the best uh, uh, models for curvature to um, uh, translation invariant v four like responses are um, single units in column five of uh, Alex. Okay, with that, uh, thank you and take any questions. variance, but we never went down below like a quarter of the receptive field 
So now we're going down to 10% of the receptive field and then throwing in other things, which you're sort of building texture out of shapes. And maybe in two years I'll have an uh, answer for you. But that's where, yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. It's a matter of scale. Thank you for that talk. Uh, so I'm curious, uh, have you been able to determine whether the position of the receptive field, whether it's more chromial or more peripheral, has any influence on whether a cell tends to be more texture responding or more um, shape responding? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, we have, we, so, you know, the there tends to be more texture selectively closer to the fovea, mm -hmm. and that matches up with Arrow's question of scale. Mm -hmm. Further out, we see less texture selectively, but um, when we so when we plot the the correlation between receptive field location and uh, texture selectivity, there is a mild negative correlation, mm -hmm. but it doesn't need significance. Gotcha. So so there, I think there is something there. Okay. Yeah, and and texture selectivity also comes in a little bit late, about twenty milliseconds later, uh, as well. So that's another another thing that answers both of your aggressive well, but this one was a small question to you. Do you have any evidence that uh, the selectivity of the, of, the, of the orientation of these cells, they get, so the selectivity gets uh, trained based on experiences like as these animals live more and more, I mean, do they, are they fixed over time or change? Because yeah, so in our routine, we are left routine. Right. So these are, I would say, these animals are you know, experts. At this point, they're completely trained, and they're just because of their experiences in the real world. But I think, I, if I remember correctly, Jim DiCarlo had a paper with um, one of his students a while back on experience and references of neurons. I, I, Jim might be able to do that better than I. Well, thank you very much.